Good. Well, a warm welcome, everybody, tonight. Um, I'm going to uh, talk tonight on uh, the river that uh, really has uh, a river that I know very, very well. Some of you may not know it so well, and um, I'm going to be showing you some very well-known paintings, uh, but also some lesser-known paintings uh, from the 19th century. So it's really a journey to today uh, taking you down um, the River Thames from its source to the estuary. Uh, I hope to do this in roughly an hour, so uh, we're going on a relatively fast boat, uh, but uh, I, I, I hope I'm going to pick out a few uh, artists uh, of interest, uh, some very great artists of course, and some much lesser known and some completely forgotten now. So just begin. I suppose when anyone uh, starts out on a journey on a river, it's a, you, you, I think of these lines um, uh, from uh, Joseph Conrad that I put up in the in the corner there. Uh, at the almost at the source of the Thames is this rather um, uh, lovely uh, stone sculpture, rather weathered these days, by B uh, Basket Lock uh, by the Italian uh, sculptor Raphael Monti. And uh, this is a depicts Old Father Thames, and uh, it's it's uh, actually it's about uh, thirty miles from the actual source of the Thames, but it but it marks uh, the the beginning of of our artistic journey really. And the map behind behind us here is in fact uh, one of the maps from uh, the Maritime Museum, which is just of the all the sandbanks on the on the vast estuary of the Thames. Uh, of course, now we have the, the wonderful uh, Margate, we have the wonderful Turner Gallery. And uh, actually, um, my last talk here was on um, JMW Turner, and we're going to be meeting some of his paintings along our route, some that actually predate the Victorian era as such, but actually are included in the 19th century. So I think it's fair that we touch upon uh, England's greatest uh, painter. So for Many of you, a lot of these places and these names of these places will be familiar to you. Um, I'm um, uh, going to mark some of these places on our talk today. Uh, obviously, uh, the, the main bulk of uh, the talk is uh, surrounds uh, uh, London and uh, the artists who congregated around there. But there are some very interesting paintings actually in the upper reaches of the Thames. Uh, the Thames is 215 miles uh, really uh, from its source to the estuary. Uh, from Teddington Lock, which is just in West London, uh, the river is uh, tidal. And this it was a great advantage to trade, basically, because unlike many other landlocked European cities, we, we actually uh, benefit from from this tide that uh, took the ships out and uh, and 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 the air ebb tide. So we, we had uh, this, this great uh, advantage, really, a, a natural advantage. The river is not obviously as, as grand as some of the great, uh, the great rivers of the world. It isn't, it, it, although quite wide in London, it is certainly nothing of the, nothing like uh, some of the, like the Danube or something like that. But, um, but, but a, a fascinating river. And of course, it has been navigable uh, since um, medieval times. And, and in fact, in some places, it was actually uh, much more able to get craft up the river um, uh, than, than you can now. Um, and uh, we have a system of locks um, uh, on the upper reaches of the Thames that make it, that make it navigable. And these, these present great advantages for, uh, for artists too, uh, very, and can be very picturesque. Uh, here's a list of some of the artists we're going to uh, meet along our route tonight. Uh, we're going to meet Dante Gabriel Rossetti, not noted for landscape paintings or indeed paintings of the Thames, but we meet him along the river uh, in a number of contexts. Um, George Vicat Cole, a famous Victorian artist. Uh, James Tiso, uh, we, we meet throughout, throughout our journey. Uh, the French Impressionist, but British artist Alfred Sisley, but had spent his life with the in French Impressionists, mostly in France, but uh, painted some significant paintings along the Thames. Claude Monet, who loved the Thames and came, came over to London many times, particularly in his later career, he enjoyed, enjoyed painting the Thames. Uh, James McNeil Whistler, the subject of my talk earlier in the year. William Holman Hunt, the Pre-Raphaelite. Uh, from Reading, uh, the uh, Havel family, particularly William Havel. Uh, George Price Boyce, who certainly uh, made it his business to be painting some of the fabulous uh, pre-Raphaelite watercolours in the upper reaches of the Thames. 
the great Birmingham water, watercolor and uh, painter, David Cox, DJ e. Gregory, who's uh, really known for really just one very famous painting of the Thames, Frederick Goodall, Augustus Egg, a very, very well loved uh, Victorian artist, GF Watts, and George Atkinson Grimshaw, who I know is a, a particular favorite, uh, Tracy, and um, John Constable as well. So those are, those are some of the artists that we'll be meeting along our way tonight. And that is a little map uh, of, the te of, the, of the Thames. And I picked out some of the places that I visited along the way. So we come to the source of the Thames, which is actually quite near the village of Coates, uh, which isn't far from Sirencester. And uh, just before, even after a quarter of a mile, it turns into that, that that's a, a rather lovely little photograph of, of the Thames. It's just a sort of marshy area, which then comes into, into a winding stream that actually becomes the Thames. And you can hardly believe when, you, when you're in this part of Gloucestershire that it's going to turn into something uh, like we can see in, in Atkinson Grimshaw's painting of 1880 by uh, uh, the Houses of Parliament. And you can see Big Ben there and the illuminated moonlight landscape, so typical of uh, John Atkinson Grimshaw's uh, middle period work. I suppose the first major uh, link with artists would have to be Kelmscott Manor, which was the bolt hole of William Morris, um, beautifully depicted in, in, in uh, his uh, News From Nowhere. And that this lovely, lovely plate here is often used, and particularly at uh, Kelmscott Manor. Uh, um, again, this is a place that I really, once uh, we're through with lockdowns, and uh, if you do visit Britain, I really suggest that you make an appointment to come to this home really of um, William Morris is uh, there's so much to see here um, a beautiful painting by Rossetti but of course it's the furnishings and just uh, the situation uh, the upper reaches of the Thames are peculiarly beautiful William Morris is actually buried at, at the little church at Kelms Court very unelaborate uh, grave marker but it's a beautiful it's a beautiful spot and uh, well worth visiting that's an aerial photograph of Kelms Court Manor and I suppose many of you will know that it, that it was at uh, Camelscott Manor that uh, Rossetti had his assignations with William Morris's uh, wife, Jane Morris. And that's, uh, these are two paintings. And you can see in the top left hand corner of the, of the right hand painting, actually, the uh, Camelscott Manor is depicted by Rossetti. And he depicts um, uh, Jane Morris here, um, both two different versions really uh, of Water Willow. In fact, one um, on the left is a sanguine drawing, but the, the Water Willow painting of 1871 is typical of, of Rossetti's middle, uh, middle to late period style and uh, his great muse, Jane Morris. And uh, uh, certainly uh, for the inspiration of the background is, is, is that part of the Thames that flows so near to Kelmscott Manor. Uh, on this aerial photograph, if you were looking, be in the top left hand corner behind the trees there, the, the Thames winds past the manor down to Buscot, uh, which is also very interesting from a point of view of pre those who love pre Raphaelite paintings. Uh, and uh, stained glass, the little church at Buscot actually has uh, some Morrison Company, very fine stained glass windows, and is again well worth visiting. As is, of course, Buscot Park. Uh, which is near the Thames, and, and it, that includes the Farringdon collection. And lovers of uh, Victorian art, um, it's a, it's a must-see venue. Uh, the Lords Farringdon have collected um, collected art, and uh, the greatest uh, thing is in 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 the collection of Edward Burne Jones is the Briar Wood from the 1890s. Such a such a fantastic uh, series of paintings. Not, not connected with the Thames as such, but the collection certainly is. And a painting that you might want to see when you're up there is um, uh, William Luca, um, a fine topographic artist, really, of, of the Victorian period. And there's his The Bloomer's Meadows at Lechlade. Lechlade is quite near uh, to Kelmscott, and you can see the spire in the distance from Kelmscott. Uh, William Morris was at the time very concerned about some of the uh, churches around um, his home and he actually um, 
uh, prevented the little, the beautiful little church on the shores of um, uh, the, the Thames uh, from being uh, uh, sort of Victorianized, and that is the little church at Inglesham, and uh, he, he protected that, and that is near Lechlade, uh, which is just across the border in, in, in Gloucestershire. So there's a, there's, a, there's a lovely little piece by uh, Matthew Arnold on, on the Thames. And we come down, just, just moving past uh, uh, some, of, some of the fine medieval bridges, of, uh, particularly of Radcott, and we, we come through some uh, beautiful, beautiful places uh, uh, as the Thames winds down its way towards Oxford. And then we come what really now lies within what we know of the Oxford Ring Road and uh, uh, the great floodplain of, of, of the Cherwells and, and the River Thames. But we come to the little um, uh, village of Binsey. Uh, which is is known for St Margaret's Church, a fine church there, uh, and and a spot that was also immortalised by the poet uh, Gerard Manley Hopkins in his Binsey Poplars, uh, but also by um, the uh, pre-Raphaelite inspired artist George Price Boyce. And now George Price Boyce is a is a close follower of the pre-Raphaelite. Um, artists, uh, truth to nature, uh, very much taking up Ruskin's dictum of painting every touch from nature. And Boyce Price uh, certainly painted um, some beautiful watercolours of this area. Um, Binsey was also highly inf influential part of um, uh, with its beautiful scenery and it had a, an effect upon um, Lewis Carroll um, and um, some of the illustrations for Alice in Wonderland as well, and uh, there's some of John Tenniel's wonderful illustrations. Can't exactly. Uh, uh, people often say Port Meadow, just near Oxford, is is the, is, is the spot. Um, but um, uh, Ludwig Dodgson, of course, uh, um, uh, was a mathematician, and uh, he was uh, 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 um, one of the dons at Christ Church. Also, um, something of a uh, of a, a, a friend to the, to the Millais, and that's his uh, uh, lovely photograph there of um, John Everett Millais' daughter, uh, Mary Millais, and there she is depicted by John Everett Millais. So we come into Oxford, and I present to you another pre-Raphaelite painting. Um, this one is by a much less known artist, but it's very much influenced by the pre-Raphaelites, like um, uh, Boyce's work. Uh, this is um, um, Mulcaster Carrick's painting of Magdalen Bridge, and uh, a, a lovely one in in the middle middle of Oxford, Magdalen Tower. Um, an earlier painting, um, uh, also depicting um, the middle of Oxford, and there are many paintings in Oxford of the Cherwell and the confluence of the Cherwell and the Isis. Of course, when it flows through Oxford, it is the Isis. And uh, it's a lovely one of Folly Bridge by Michael Angelo Rooker, just at the turn of the um, uh, turn of the nineteenth century. And uh, but a particularly fine painting by an artist who's, who did a number of paintings, uh, in particularly in the eighteen seventies and eighteen eighties, is George Fycat Cole. Uh, particularly influenced by John Constable, but he had something more of the rigour of the pre-Raphaelites in his touch. Uh, particularly, there's, there's, there is this uh, intense detail in some of his work, but this is Ifley Mill. So just as you're leaving, coming southward of Oxford, you, 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 there is the old mill at Ifley. And there's some very fine uh, photographs of Ifley Mill. Ifley Mill no longer actually exists, although the millstone still exists there, and, there's a, and there is a, a, a pub near there called the... Um, uh, uh, just on, on the banks of Tiffley, and there is a lock there as well. But uh, the scene is much more or less unchanged, uh, although, of course, you can hear the roar of the ring road if you go there now. But uh, Vicat Cole is, was a fine painter and certainly very much of this um, uh, late mid to late Victorian uh, Royal Academy tradition, and we'll meet him a little bit further on down the Thames. Uh, the young uh, J.M.W. Turner would stay uh, in Sunningwell with, with his uncle, and uh, when he was there, and this one he painted when he was about 12 years old, 12 or 13 years old, and there's the lovely property of the Harcourt uh, family uh, at Newnham Courtney, and this, paint, this painting, um, unremarkable painting really, unless we knew who it was by, and of course it is by, by Turner as a, as a very young man, but he was um, invited to paint on, on the Harcourt estate uh, from their fine um, classical um, mansion, which stands high on a bluff above the Thames. Um, 
it's an interesting place uh, is is Newnham Courtney and it, and it plays a part actually in 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 uh, uh, the artistic life of of uh, the city of Oxford in many ways um, it uh, it was uh, the Harcourt family were great um, patrons of the arts uh, moving up from their uh, former um, house, uh, Stanton Harcourt, which was on low lying ground, and then they decided to rebuild and, and relocate at Newnham Courtney. In fact, they demolished the village there. Um, but a very fine spot to look at the River Thames, um, captured by Joseph Farrington RA. Now, Joseph Farrington, possibly a forgotten artist today, but he was actually the man who um, inspired John Constable to become a full time artist. So we have Farrington to thank for that. And he painted these sort of topographic watercolours in the early part of the 19th century. That's an example of, of one of his views of the Thames at Newnham Courtney, at the wood just below, just below the property. You can see uh, Newnham, Newnham Courtney in the distance there. Um, and, and, and it's a very, um, a, a landscape in the tradition of uh, Francis Town um, and a number of the other watercolourists of the early 19th century. Uh, the fine Oxford conduit stands in the grounds of Newnham Courtney, and you can spy it from the river. Um, two or three months uh, ago, I ventured across the grounds of Newnham Courtney onto private property and took this photograph of Oxford uh, Carfax conduit, which was stood in the middle of Oxford until uh, the 18th century when it was removed into the park at Newnham Courtney, and a very fine uh, um, object it is. And very well worth seeing actually. And here are the uh, Harcourts uh, as painted by uh, Sir Joshua Reynolds, but the um, generation that concerns the Victorian era, we have um, uh, William George Granville or Venable, Venables Vernon Harcourt, and uh, there he is in the left, and uh, there, this was the sort of playground of um, uh, certainly some of the, the, the more well-to-do in, in the uh, 1870s and 1880s. And um, uh, particularly James Tiso came uh, to Newnham, uh, Newnham Courtney. And uh, that's a, a photograph I've taken on exactly the same spot from the other side of the river looking across. And there is, uh, this is exactly where Tiso painted his painting of uh, these um, uh, Victorian women uh, um, getting in, into their uh, uh, little boat across uh, from the elaborate um, Newnham Courtney boathouse. Um, and uh, certainly Newnham, Newnham Courtney is, was a very, um, a place where so many uh, Victorian, uh, uh, well-to-do Victorians and artists uh, would, would come and including uh, Frederick Layton uh, later on in, in, the, um, uh, in the Victorian period. But the greatest artist really of the River Thames is, is Turner and Turner had a boatman and uh, he returns to the Thames, um, particularly uh, during the time of the early 18, 1800s, he was working on his Al Oxford Almanac, but at the same time he was also doing filling sketchbooks and drawings of the Thames. And uh, these are two paintings that are of the upper part of the Thames, uh, the Union of the Thames and Isis from 1808. Uh, this one's in uh, Tate Britain, but rarely shown. Um, shows the influence of uh, Dutch art and Albert Koip, um, uh, but, a, but a, a bit of painting. Uh, can't exactly uh, identify the spot, but um, uh, Turner's got massive numbers of sketchbooks in, in, the, in the Tate uh, Britain, and, uh, and we can sort of link the, link the sketches that he made. Um, and this one uh, of the the Thames navigation, which was turned into a navigate, was turned into an engraving from his watercolour um, of Abingdon on Thames, and that is fully identifiable, um, where, where you you get the the lock system just below Abingdon. Uh, Abingdon is where the River Ock joins the Thames. The Thames is joined at a number of places by uh, smaller tributaries, and um, all of these uh, also uh, require various lock gates. And of course, uh, these were highly developed by uh, uh, the early 1800s, and um, and and uh, the river was navigable all the way through. So uh, there's the spire of the Great St Helen Church in the background. Uh, now this this is a rather curious painting from 1806. Uh, it's a sort of um, a, a mixture of both Abingdon and Dorchester. 
uh, kind of confuses the two, um, but it's a distinctly um, a Thames painting anyway, and um, and uh, a fine painting in his early style, uh, pre his uh, trips to um, Italy. And uh, a fine painter of the latter part of the, the Victorian era was John Les Don Dunlop Leslie, and uh, he paints in a um, rather like Viscat Cole in a quite in a quite uh, rigorous manner. Uh, this depicts um, the Great um, Norman Bridge at Wallingford, um, very important uh, place, Wallingford on Thames. This used to have a, a great castle until it was sacked in the um, in the Civil War. Um, it used to have a, a, a fire and there's, there are ruins of the castle standing there. It was one of the, the largest castles in, 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 in England until that point. But the Great Bridge at Wallingford still stands and uh, it's uh, depicted here by um, uh, Leslie, who was uh, a fine landscape painter of this period, if a little conventional. Another artist who actually lived in Wallingford, who was an important artist of the Victorian era, was Henry Stacey Marks, and he lived just by the boathouse here in Wallingford. Um, he is particularly famed for his paintings of, of birds in the Victorian era, often birds, bird life by the uh, River Thames, and here he paints a heron, and you can often see herons by the Thames, or the upper reaches of the Thames, they're quite common these days. Uh, Stacey Marks did a lot of work uh, for um, the Duke of, Grove, uh, Duke of Westminster, uh, uh, Hugh Lupus Grosvenor. And, and his paintings can be found at Eton Call. And uh, so he was an important artist of the uh, Victorian era and, and an RA. Uh, his paintings can also be seen at St. Leonard's Church in uh, Wallingford, in, in the apse of the church. And, uh, uh, but his more or less forgotten artist these days is Henry Stacey Marks. But uh, an artist, if you're interested in Victorian painting, one who, who would be worth looking up. And uh, his, he uh, certainly, uh, some of his paintings are quite amusing too. He, he, he uses birds to um, sort of uh, make comments on, on um, human situations. A very fine artist of um, uh, the 1840s, 1850s was David Cox, and he was somebody that actually Ruskin uh, noted in in in, uh, in in some of his uh, in some of his uh, writings uh, of that period uh, as he was beginning modern painters. And David Cox was proficient both in watercolor and also in oil color, but he's particularly well known for these these watercolors. And this is a lovely view that he painted of Goring and Street beyond Thames. So we come down river from Wallingford and uh, the Thames is widening out and the villages of Goring and Street, they find fine little places. The bridge is still a, a bridge, something like that. It has a has a, 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 a little navigation around the side of it. There's a, there's a weir there as well. Um, but, but Cox is known for this amount of light that he gets into his watercolors. There's a nice touch to his watercolor and he really uh, gives Turner a run for his money with some of his watercolors. Uh, and a very, a very fine painter is David Cox. Um, uh, if we look at some of um, the uh, Joseph Farrington also continued down his trip down the Thames. Remember, showed you one of his ones of Newnham Courtney. He also paints this part of the where we get some of the Berkshire Downs and uh, the winding passage of the Thames there. And that's another Joseph Farrington watercolour. Uh, of uh, just at uh, Streetly or Basildon, I think that one would be. Uh, and George Price Boyce uh, comes down from Oxford, and here he is you're painting the Thames near Whitchurch. Um, and it wouldn't, I wouldn't really be able to identify that had not um, George Price Boyce actually said where that was. But he also painted uh, some very good um, paintings of the barns at Whitchurch as well, and in the pre Raphaelite manner. And, but he's particularly well known for these paintings that he did at Maple Durham. And Maple Durham is, um, is, is, a, is a fine um, uh, mansion uh, dating from the late Elizabethan and early Jacobean period, um, at the home of the Blount family, uh, a recusant family. They have a, there's a Catholic chapel there and a very fine church. Uh, some of you who are aficionados of um, uh, film and uh, of Michael Caine will remember there was a film called The Eagle Has Landed, which was actually shot in Maple Durham Village. And I can remember as a, as a young man, I remember when all the film crew arrived there because I lived in Caversham nearby. And, uh, but uh, Boyce actually uh, painted uh, these fine pre-Raphaelite paintings of Maple Durham Mill, which still stands exactly the same today as in the Boyce picture. Uh, the, 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 in fact, that we're 
uh, encouraged because the uh, road in Maple Durham does not go to a bridge that crosses the Thames and it's kept the village pretty much intact uh, with no buildings there. No, nothing has been added in the 20th century. So it's a, it's, it's a rather lovely place. And Vicat Cole also saw that and he paints the, paints the dot locks at Maple Durham. Uh, and that's a very nice view of the back of Maple Durham House by, uh, from the uh, Physic Garden at the, uh, uh, behind, the, um, behind the house. Uh, a very fine mansion to visit. Um, uh, Alexander Pope stayed there and he seems to have stayed a lot of places along the Thames. Uh, I would say the interior decor of Maple Durham House leaves something to be desired. It's, it's, it was obviously uh, re redone in the Victorian era and, uh, and is, not, uh, is not as good as its exterior, but still a place to visit and a lovely village. We go further on down towards Reading and of course Reading's a huge, huge town um, these days, a vast place really full of uh, um, uh, industrial parks and uh, computers and offices and all that sort of thing. Um, but this is a lot of the lovely painting by William Havel uh, from 1811. Now the Havels were a very important family in, uh, of artists in Reading, particularly they were engravers. Um, some of the, uh, Robert Havel went actually over to the USA and he actually joined some of the artists on Hudson River School and uh, I, I mentioned him when I gave my little talk about 19th century um, American painting. But William Havel is known for these type of watercolours. This is just painted slightly above uh, St Peter's Churchyard, upon a bluff just above St Peter's Churchyard in Caversham, and it looks across to the old Caversham Bridge. There is now a, a bridge of the about 1930 which goes across there. But that's the old Caversham Bridge, and, and at that stage uh, you can see the river wasn't, wasn't bound in either side. Of course now it has a, has a, the, the banks are all fully uh, sort of concreted in and uh, on just by the little lock house on the right is near where the famous um, Reading Festival is held every year, uh, the, the Rock Festival. But Havel was a very fine, uh, fine watercolorist and uh, in the tradition of uh, Francis Town and uh, uh, lot, many of his paintings are in fact at uh, Reading Museum and Art Gallery and uh, a very fine collection of his work there, but uh, not an artist so well known these days. But an artist who is pretty well known, and we've already encountered him at Newnham Courtney, is James Tiso. Uh, he, he came to um, London in, eight, uh, in 1870 following, following the Paris Commune. Um, he, he lived with his uh, common law partner, uh, Mrs. Newton, in, in London. And he's known for his scenes of high society and, fashion, and Victorian fashion. Uh, Ruskin detested his paintings, calling them mere hand-painted colour photographs. Um, and, I, and I would admit that his paintings can be a little bit sickly, a little bit sentimental. But he did paint uh, uh, this period uh, like nobody else really did, and he depicted the balls and the, and, and the society events, and of course Henley being one of the great, great events in the, in the season. And he paints this view of the Henley Regatta in 1877. Not much has changed in, in the intervening years. This is painted from Henley Bridge. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and Henley is, of course, uh, fam famous for its uh, great regatta and boat races in, in the summer. And nowadays, the, the great Henley Festival. Um, so, and uh, he concentrates really on, on the, uh, the fashions, which of course is still an important part of, of the Henley season. Uh, Tiso was a great friend of Edouard Manet, but a he had a much tighter um, style than, than Manet, although he was captivated by, um, you know, light and uh, certainly uh, his better paintings, one always uh, has the sense of the shimmering light upon the waters. Uh, so that's that's uh, Tiso at uh, Henley. But Tiso was uh, later, uh, following uh, the death of uh, uh, Mrs. Newton, um, he went through a, a personal crisis and and, and in fact uh, reconverted uh, to Catholicism and then spent the rest of his life uh, painting biblical paintings. And uh, his um, he, his great series, The Prodigal Son in Modern Life, uh, was. Uh, some of them were painted by the banks of the River Thames. And I presume this one was painted near Wargrave or, or, or Henley from what I can identify. And this is um, uh, the, the prodigal son 
um, uh, coming coming back and and the fatted calf upon the table, and uh, so this is this is part of part of part of this great series, and it's and it relies uh, in this series upon um, uh, the sort of storytelling that we get in in paintings by William Hogarth. And uh, it's, it's a great thing in Victorian painting to send uh, to tell us a story through a painting. They're almost like illustrations, rather. And we'll see that when we look at Augustus's eggs paintings. And um, uh, Victorians loved it. If one year you painted one painting and then there was a sort of answer to it the next year at the Royal Academy. And so uh, uh, Tiso, even though his paintings no longer were all about the the, the, the um, fripperies of fashion, um, and they had a slightly more serious bent after his conversion. Uh, uh, they still have, uh, we can still lot of, learn a lot about the Victorian era from them. Now include a, a paint, Millet's painting of Alfred Lord Tennyson, which is in the Lady Lever Art Gallery, because Tennyson was in fact married at the church at Ship Lake, and Ship Lake is just down, uh, down river from Henley, and there's uh, William Gosling's painting of Ship Lake Lock. And uh, again, uh, rather dilapidated there, um, but there is a lock there and the river is fully navigable there. The banks of the river are very, very high at Ship Lake. And uh, so one gets some tremendous views over the winding river as it goes uh, in down, um, down uh, uh, along from Reading. Um, that, that painting on the right hand is actually before of the, of the similar, looking back towards Henley uh, from the Wargrave Road, but it is a fine part of the landscape. There's, it's, it's not exactly a gorge, but there's, there's some very high um, uh, sort of bluffs above the river there. And in fact, the most expensive house in, in Great Britain at the moment is Park Place near Henley. And that is now owned by a Russian oligarch, apparently. I don't know, I can't remember his name exactly, but, um, uh, but some of these houses are quite interesting because they do have wonderful collections, were one to get into them, and uh, certainly some uh, fantastic collections of 19th century art um, by repute. Um, Park Place was actually painted by the um, uh, 20th century artist, John Piper, a number of times. But uh, uh, these days, one cannot get into Park Place, unfortunately. I'm sure it's got some very fine art there. Um, now, an artist uh, associated with the village of Cookham, where you would perhaps, if you, if you like uh, uh, 20th century art, you would say, oh, it's Stanley Spencer, the great Sir Stanley Spencer. Uh, but actually, it was an artist in Cookham of the Victorian era who was, who was a highly celebrated artist. And he's, um, his memorial is in Cookham Church, and he is George Frederick Walker. And he was both a fine uh, book illustrator and painter of the Victorian era. And uh, I've I just depicted two of his um, two prints. One is an illustration called Summer Days from 1866. So those so people getting ready to swim in the river at Cookham. And uh, the other one uh, shows a, a, a little part of the uh, a river just going into the River Thames at Cookham. And you see Cookham Church in the background there. Uh, but, but George Frederick Water, Walker lived in Cookham. And if one were to gaze behind Cookham, you notice that there is, a, there, is a, there is a hill behind Cookham. And this became an extremely important place in, 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 in the latter part of the Victorian period um, and, and, uh, seat and uh, home of the Astor family. And they were responsible for uh, really um, re reviving uh, Cliveden and uh, it's uh, again uh, the American millionaire William Waldorf Astor, um, uh, as depicted by Hubert von Herkomer, a fine Victorian artist there. And he was responsible also for this, this early little temple or chapel which overlooks the Thames on the uh, Cliveden estate. But you get some of the finest views of the Thames from Cliveden. And that painting there by Florence Kate Kingsford also was painted at Cliveden. It, uh, it doesn't actually, it's a more sort of pre letter day pre Raphaelite painting uh, than it doesn't actually depict uh, some of the shenanigans of the um, uh, 1960s that took place at uh, Cliveden. Um, it actually depicts a sort of more um, a sort of allegorical scene uh, placed on the Thames um, uh, and it's Sweet Thames runs softly. But here we are at Cliveden and uh, 
Turner painted it before Cliveden really became such a celebrated place in 1807. That's his view of Cliveden, probably painted from near Cookham. Um, but uh, this fine portrait of Nancy by Countess Astor was painted uh, by John Singer Sargent, and that painting is still at Cliveden, and uh, many um, it's this sort of American students are there at Cliveden and uh, the, the uh, grounds of the National Trust and it's an excellent place to visit. Uh, Lord Frederick Lord Leighton painted at Cliveden and uh, there's a lovely little landscape of his just painted at Cliveden and I know this path well that leads down to the river and uh, some lovely yew trees there and that's a uh, you know a, 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 the painter of Flaming June also wasn't above painting these, such a lovely painting of this um, of uh, this, uh, of these trees, uh, uh, just on the little path going down to the river here at Cliveden, and there is Lord Layson by Thomas Brock. And we come down from Cliveden, you come to Bolter's Lock, and uh, again, all the, all the Henley crowd would go down there. And this is probably the fame, the most famous painting by uh, Edward Gregory, and this is called Bolter's Lock. And this painting is in the Lady Lever Art Gallery in Port Sunlight. It gives us a very good idea of um, as we come into in, into the Belle Epoque and uh, uh, Bolter's Lock and you can see all the fine fashions similar to Tiso, very very tight sort of painting in many ways but it has something of of, of the uh, the fashions of the Henley and the, the regatta and and all of that and there's another view by uh, an artist called Ward at Bolter's Lock of the Thames regatta too get an examples of the fashion not a particularly great painting that one but Bolter's Lock is a is is an important area really and there are a lot of celebrities who now live along that, that that part of the river as you come into Maidenhead but a very very much greater painting is of course Turner's Rain Steam and Speed which was painted in Maidenhead or painted from Maidenhead uh, Bridge uh, overlooking the Great Western Railway in 1844 and this is one of the very very great paintings of Turner and I've talked about this in some of my talks before. Um, but of course it, it depicts uh, this, this the challenge of modern times and 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 the, the train racing towards us just like the future is racing towards us and uh, a, a, a really remarkable piece of painting when one considers its date and and uh, and its sheer audacity in, in use of paint. Uh, you see the, the railway bridge on the right and you can see the old uh, Bath Road bridge on the left and in between uh, the landscape, uh, the more, uh, one makes out more if you stand in front of this painting in the National Gallery, the more you look at it, the more you see in it, in fact, and, uh, and it's a fascinating piece of work. And I, I mentioned this in my uh, talk on Turner quite recently. And we come on down and, and uh, Turner was, uh, of course, painted in uh, Windsor Castle in 1807. And uh, Windsor Castle was, was always a, a, a favourite spot for so many artists. Particularly, I like this painting by Paul Sandby um, uh, from uh, well, that's a part of his career, and it shows um, uh, Windsor Castle on a firework night from um, Datchet Lane, which is a low, a low meadowy uh, sort of area just below Windsor Castle. But it, uh, that's a typical one of Sandby. Later on, this this painting here by Emile Blanche is um, certainly a, a, a later nineteenth century painting, uh, looking across Eton Bridge uh, and across the castle, and uh, in a more impressionistic style. And Landseer, of course, was employed frequently at, at Windsor, and there he depicts uh, uh, the young Queen Victoria uh, with Prince Albert um, uh, at Windsor. Uh, uh, actually, Landseer sort of avoided the river in many, you, know, you could just about make it in, out in some of his paintings, but uh, um, certainly Turner paints some lovely paintings down by the river at Windsor, and, uh, and they've got a fine number of these at uh, Tate Britain, which are well worth seeking out. And Frederick Goodall paints a uh, great, um, possibly better known for his paintings in Egypt and uh, his classical subjects, but Goodall uh, also painted from ramparts of Windsor Castle. And this is a particularly fine one, looking across the water meadows from where uh, Sandby was looking up, we're looking down. And uh, this gives a great example of, of the river plain coming across. And you really get those lovely views across from the ramparts of Windsor Castle. Uh, Henry Pether paints uh, Windsor Castle by moonlight and uh, Pether makes uh, uh, his business is really just painting paintings by moonlight rather sort of a Caspar David Friedrich but no, not, not really up to that uh, but he's an artist who was a now forgotten artist of the um, 
uh, mid to late 19th century, um, and that's his moon, Moonlight of uh, Windsor Castle. A much finer artist is Peter de Wint, and some of his watercolours and his particularly his sketchbooks, I think, are particularly fine of the Thames, and they're well worth seeing. And uh, they're very uh, vigorous watercolours, um, very beautiful. And uh, there's his painting at Bray on Thames in Berkshire. And uh, that is the place where uh, Heston Blumenthal's uh, restaurant, The Fat Duck, is. Um, but that's the church at Bray in Berkshire. And uh, that's quite near a, a very uh, celebrated spot in the in the 17th and 18th centuries was one Monkey Island at Bray. And uh, that is now home of a number of hotels and gated communities. But it's, a, it's an interesting spot on the Thames. And uh, uh, many artists are attracted to this part of the Thames particularly because it, it winds in this part. So you get a lovely sort of S, the, 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 the great uh, picturesque S of the river, which is, is something that's very important to painters. And Turner also, as we come down the river towards Twickenham and, uh, and West London as, as London approaches, but of course, Twickenham was quite apart from London in Turner's life, lifetime. Um, he builds, uh, he, he designs a, a, a house for his old dad at uh, Solus Lodge in Twickenham uh, and uh, one can one can visit that now and that is a memorial to Ter Turner. Uh, Turner also painted the ferry at Isleworth at sunset and uh, but out of a previous century Thomas Rawlinson painted uh, on e Eel Pie Island and um, that was also rather like uh, Monkey Island was a, a, another celebrated spot. Eel Pie Island of course became quite famous in the uh, uh, mid 20th century for uh, uh, both the the music and uh, uh, you know the Rolling Stones and David Bowie and people like that all cut their teeth at Eel Pie Island, uh, but that's way beyond the remit of this particular talk. It was also an area around here. Twickenham was also um, uh, uh, a favourite of um, uh, James Thompson and uh, Alexander Pope, the poets. Uh, so this part of it, you were sort of out of London, but it, but, but close enough to London uh, to be a part of things, but away from all the, um, uh, you know, the hustle and bustle. And uh, uh, so Alexander Pope particularly liked this area and uh, wrote on it. And uh, and so the area of uh, we're coming in towards Hampton Court um, and uh, uh, the painter James Wingfield paints uh, around Ham Hampton Court in the uh, in the, 19, in, in the 19th century. Um, his paintings are quite uh, uh, in the tradition of um, Bonington's paintings. Um, um, and again, another lesser known Victorian artist, a much greater artist who painted at this period in, in the 1870s, uh, in, in, uh, uh, painted a number of views on the Thames, was the French Impressionist, although English artist, Alfred Sisley. And his one at um, uh, the Weir there uh, is, is a particularly fine painting and a, quite a radical composition, really, uh, if one thinks of uh, other Victorian paintings from this period. And uh, the Belgian painter, Haman, uh, also painted a number of scenes upon the River Thames, or historic scenes, recording historic scenes. And uh, he recalls uh, the, the, the century before of uh, the great um, uh, concerts upon the river and Handel's water music. And there, there's one of his paintings. And we meet Vicat Cole again, this very, very, another view rather like the view from Cliveden. You get this wonderful view at the top of Richmond Hill of the River Thames, and you look back down the river, and it is a wonderful view, painted by uh, Turner um, on Richmond Hill uh, in 1819, a very, very uh, Claude-inspired landscape there by Turner. Uh, but Vicat Cole copies that in the Victorian era, and his Richmond Hill um, combines both the sort of um, <coughs> the Victorians promenading upon that that path uh, uh, above the um, Deer Park at Richmond, a uh, very, very fine view. Uh, and again, Tiso also paints down by uh, Richmond Bridge. Uh, Tiso has actually done something with his painting here. He's, he's changed the um, angle of Richmond Bridge. It's, it's nothing like as uh, steep as that. I don't think the cars could cross Richmond Bridge were it that steep. Um, so he's taken a little bit of license there. Um, but that's a typical Tiso painting on the right there. I like this one by um, uh, Turner of Kew Bridge with at Brentford. Um, now, uh, 
Turner had an, had uh, family in in uh, Brentford and would stay there, and uh, so his early love of the Thames really was a, a lot to do with this. And he paints these very very fine watercolours looking uh, down these parts of the Thames. And uh, I mean, one could do a series. I could just show you all the ones that Turner painted, and we really wouldn't have to look at these lesser known artists. But um, certainly, this, this this is a very fine watercolour. And as you can see, Turner is very economical in his, in his painting. He he doesn't feel everything every leaf has to be depicted as as some of the Victorian painters did. Um, that's a, a sketchbook of his there also at the Tate. And there's another one of Alfred Sisley painted from under the railway bridge at Kew. Again, quite a radical composition. And here's a photograph I've taken of uh, the rail bridge at Kew from the same position. And uh, as we move down river, of course, we think of uh, the, the lovely, lovely um, book uh, by J. Jerome K. Jerome, of uh, The Three Men in a Boat, which recalls so many of these places. Uh, you also, also, if you're in, into art and you're visiting uh, Britain, I would suggest visiting Hogarth's house at Chis Chiswick is also well worth it. Uh, it doesn't have very many Hogarth's paintings, but they have some of some of the objects associated with him and lots of his prints. And it's very it was uh, also rather like um, Pope. He had a he had a bolt hole in Chiswick, which was his um, sort of out of town ho home, which is uh, well preserved. And Thomas Gainsborough also lived at Kew, one of uh, Britain's most famous painters, and he was buried at uh, St Anne's Church in Kew, and you can visit his grave. He didn't want any fine memorial made to him, it's just a simple slab, it's just been restored recently, and uh, but well worth visiting is the church in Kew, uh, as is Kew Gardens, and the gallery there has a lot of uh, Victorian botanical paintings, and there's a view of the botanic art at um, uh, Kew Gardens, which are uh, Miss North's paintings. A lovely collection and uh, 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 really people might just go to Kew Gardens purely for the pagoda and looking around the hot houses and, and the flowers but do visit the art gallery there because you get a, a rare um, chance to see some of the um, uh, inter interesting botanic art of the Victorian era um, which is sometimes neglected. And uh, if you're in that area of London, beside the river is St Nicholas's Churchyard and uh, uh, two very different artists are both um, in St Nicholas's Churchyard, their tombs, James Abbott McNeil Whistler's tomb, and uh, quite close by to it is uh, William Hogarth's tomb as well. And of course, uh, both uh, worked close by the river and the river features in their art. And the and I also include a lovely picture of the old Walton Bridge there painted uh, from again a century before the era, but it's this wonderful painting from the Dulwich Picture Gallery by Canaletto of, of Old Walton Bridge, which I think is a, a remarkable piece of painting and a, a wonderful Canaletto and a, sort of more interesting in some ways than some of his uh, Venetian views, I think. A lot of atmosphere in that one particularly. And as we come down river, this is uh, the other Kelmscott House. And I thought I'd show you this. This is Kelmscott House in Hammersmith facing the river. Um, but this is um, uh, the home to the William Morris Society now, lots of the archives are there and uh, uh, unfortunately for William Morris of course it, uh, the world of Hammersmith is very much the world that he was resisting throughout his life um, and the uh, David and Murray Smith's painting really shows you why and that is some of the wharves and the warehouses of Hammersmith painted there in the uh, early 19th century, uh, early 20th century, sorry. Um, but uh, certainly uh, uh, the house, Kelmscott House at Hammersmith, well worth visiting too, if you like William Morris. And a little bit further down river, we come to Battersea, old Battersea Bridge here depicted by Walter Graves, the boatman for, for James McNeil Whistler. Uh, that bridge, of course, has now no longer exists. Uh, Whistler loved that bridge for the fact that it looked like a Japanese footbridge. Uh, and Graves was his boatman and a friend and a studio assistant until the two fell out in, in the 1880s. Uh, but that's a typical painting by Graves, very fine painting, that one. And uh, that's, of course, the great uh, uh, Whistler painting of the Battersea Bridge, where he turns it into this wonderful um, foot, a Japanese footbridge, and that depict, and that is uh, Cheney Walk, uh, the home of the uh, the great uh, Chelsea artists of the um, Victorian era, and uh, both Rossetti, uh, who lives at sixteen Cheney Walk, and Whistler's studio at ninety six Cheney Walk, uh, both friends and uh, or uh, associated with one another in many ways. 
and uh, many of the artists who lived at Cheney Walk in Chelsea. And uh, it wasn't far for Whistler to go to paint some of his most remarkable paintings of the Thames. And a bit further up from there was Tite Street as well, which was the home of John Singer Sargent. <coughs> and there's the painting, which was the controversial painting uh, that, that so uh, caused Ruskin so uh, such great difficulty and the result, and the result of the lawsuit. And of course, Cremorne Gardens was quite close to the river and that was where the fireworks were fired from and that is where the lights are over the River Thames. And that is the painting which is now in the Detroit Art Institute. And further down the river, we come to the Tate Gallery and the Tate Gallery, or, which is known as Tate Britain now, uh, is very, very close to the river and actually in the um, in the early part of the um, uh, 20th century, uh, some of the basement of the Tate was actually flooded and actually damaged some of Turner's paintings and a big painting by John Martin. And that's the great Victorian gallery at Tate Britain. So we hope that never happens again. We now got a tent Thames tidal barrier, which should protect us from such a, an eventuality. But I always am slightly nervous about uh, what is held in the basement at the Tate gallery. And that is the great uh, Victorian gallery, as imagined by um, the artist Julia Batten uh, in a recent series. And this is just a sort of mock up of, uh, of that, uh, uh, those days from the 1920s, we're taking the paintings out of the uh, basement. And a great uh, social realist uh, painter was uh, Augustus Egg, uh, a friend of Holman Hunt, and uh, but not, not exactly a pre-Raphaelite, he was of an older generation, but of course Augustus Egg here um, paints his this great series Past and Present, and here he shows the result of um, really the, the, the great theme of the Victorian art, the fallen woman, uh, uh, fallen away from her, from her, her, mar her marriage is broken up. She has an illegitimate child and she ends up in this arch and uh, stares out at the moon. And this is the final part of the series, Despair. And it really is echoed also in, in G.F. Watts's great painting, Found Drowned, uh, inspired by Thomas Hood's poem, The Bridge of Sighs. And uh, that is Watts's great, uh, great painting, also painted underneath Westminster Bridge there. Almost a Whistlerian la landscape in the background. But Rossetti at one point couldn't resist a sort of bit of a bit of um, modern realism to some extent. He never finished his great painting Found, begun in 1854, uh, but painted on the banks of, of the River Thames. And um, there the a young drover returns uh, to uh, London to find his uh, childhood sweetheart has turned to prostitution and he tries and, and, he, and he comes uh, to, to uh, take her back and uh, she turns her head away. And so, but Renati never actually finished this painting, which I believe is in the uh, museum in Delaware, Wilmington, Delaware. But uh, again, a, a, a pre-Raphaelite painting, uh, somewhat inspired by Ford Maddox Brown as well and possibly to some extent by uh, William Holman Hunt and the pre-Raphaelites love for uh, William Hogarth. One of the great events beside the river and one of the great paintings of the River Thames is of course, uh, Turner's painting, The Burning of the Houses of Lords and Commons uh, from 1834, 1835. Uh, it sort of echoes the paintings of the Great Fire of London by this un unknown artist, but Turner brings it into an in in this incredible uh, sort of uh, boiling point of, of just uh, just flame, and uh, and uh, he captures all of all of the uh, drama of, the, of that great night um, of of the um, of October eighteen thirty four in a series of watercolors and paintings that are like no other, and they are really very very expressive. It's well worth looking at some of the watercolors for these as well. And and he and he uh, gives the the, the the scene such drama and um, but such spectacle and particularly favoured favoured of the colours of the eighteen forties where he really let loose with his palette by this stage. So come on to the next. Sorry, come on to the next one. And uh, to some extent, uh, if we look at this other painting by Turner's 
turn of the burning of houses of commons. And we can see something of that uh, also in, in, in Claude Monet's painting of the House of Lords, uh, painted later on in Monet's career, 1906. He was a very well established artist then. He was able to stay at the Savoy and um, so no longer a starving artist anymore. Nobody, some, someone who had to just sort of scrounge around for oil paint. He was, he was a very well off man by, by the early 20th century. But, um, but he loved London, did Claude Monet, and he had painted there from the 1870s. And he loved, particularly liked the uh, pea super fogs that uh, seemed to shroud the city so often. And this is one of his earlier paintings uh, when he and Pissarro came to London in the 1870s, 1872, during the Franco-Prussian War. And I think this one of the Pool of London is one of uh, Monet's great paintings of, of this part of London. It really, really sums it up and uh, just, just wonderful, uh, a wonderful piece of painting, uh, freehand painting by, uh, by Claude Monet here. Um, but an artist who was painting, you know, almost at the same time uh, is, is William Holman Hunt, pre-Raphaelite, on a return from Palestine. He paints, uh, in 1866, he paints uh, London Bridge on the night of the marriage of the Prince and Princess of Wales. Uh, it, it, is, it is, again, in, in uh, a great debt to Ho William Hogarth in this painting, and there's a lot of instant going on uh, within the painting. There's things like pickpockets, there's uh, various pictures of friends, um, particularly Thomas Coombe is, is depicted in this painting. As I've just done in the top right-hand corner, you can see I've just picked him out. This painting is in the Ashmolean Museum. Uh, there are little vignettes in the painting too, which one in the background, it almost looks like a little mini kind of uh, whistler in, in, in the top uh, left hand. Um, but William Holman Hunt actually painted this curious painting in Chelsea in 1853, which predates uh, James McNeil Whistler's arrival in London. And this little panel painting shows that, that Holman Hunt could be um, really a whistler before Whistler was even Whistler. So an interesting little panel painting, that one. Uh, Holman Hunt was fascinated by moonlight and uh, uh, the depiction of moonlight. And uh, uh, well, we can see that from his painting, The Light of the World and some of Triumph of the Innocents that appear uh, and a painting called The Ship. So he was always interested in different light sources, but in a very different way to the French Impressionists. But that's a great painting of, of, of the bridge and uh, a, a superb painting, really. And another bit, and here's Tiso again uh, in, in his heyday. Here he paints. Um, uh, what I like about this painting, it contrasts the sort of ease of, of the well to do with their bottles of champagne uh, on, on their little launch going through the Pool of London. But look at the absolute filth and uh, choking fumes in the background. It's a wonder that uh, they, they wouldn't have a sort of gas mask on with the amount of steam and, uh, and uh, just a sheer effluent around the Pool of London this time. Um, but we can see what Ruskin meant about hand-painted photographs when we look at this particular Tissot painting, great friend of, of Edouard Manet. And the river was absolutely filthy during this period until, um, thankfully, uh, Bazalgette with his, um, with his new sewer, sewerage system really saved London from uh, really the disastrous years of the late 1850s of the Great Stink, um, uh, leading to um, really, uh, you know, terrible outbreaks of epidemics of cholera and uh, also just the, the, the sheer um, you know just impossible impossibility of actually working in parts of London such was such was its uh, the foul smell and uh, uh, nothing nothing was, was you know sort of living in within the Thames at that stage and of course there was great disasters even when the sewage was taken out and dumped in the estuary there was also uh, the tragedy of in, in uh, 1878 of the sinking of the SS Princess Alice uh, where, where many people were lost and, uh, and uh, so uh, there were all sorts of um, uh, the Thames was not, did not look like really Camille Passaro's river of um, 1890 um, during the 1870s. It was still cleaning up the river and it's still a, a, a river full of, um, you know, was, it didn't look bright and blue like that, I, I'm pretty certain. And uh, many are uh, uh, the depictions in the Victorian era of the mudlarks of the Thames. And a lot of Victorian artists. This one, uh, for, um, Thomas Graham's painting of a mudlark, is typical of this. Uh, the, the, these were those who beachcombed the river 
Thames um, making a good living or something of a living anyway from going beachcombing the shores of the Thames. I uh, remember it's tidal, the, the Thames in London. And so uh, people were to pick up things and particularly during this period with so much uh, commerce being conducted on the river, there were, there were sometimes rich pickings. And Pether again, this great moonlight painter of the Victorian era, uh, paints the Watergate. Uh, the Watergate has now been moved in position, but uh, it's a fine uh, piece of uh, architecture too. And um, uh, Pether depicts uh, some mudlarks beside the Thames there. And that's a much finer painter of uh, moonlight. This is John Atkinson Grimshaw, uh, uh, who, who was a painter from Nostrop Hall in, in, up in Leeds and uh, Headingley. And he, he comes down to London and he paints some very, very fine nocturnes in London. Uh, influenced by the Pre-Raphaelites, also one would say he was very much influenced by uh, photography. Um, so his paintings um, are a combination of both uh, sort of Whistlerian colour, um, but also a fastidious uh, detail, and, uh, but they're very, very atmospheric and, and have become very, very popular paintings, although he didn't, he wasn't really an academic painter, but his paintings were, were uh, considered um, by many to be um, uh, some of the fine period, uh, paintings of the period, and uh, certainly Whistler recognised Grimshaw's work. One of the great uh, Thames paintings is this one by John Constable at the opening of Waterloo Bridge in 1817. Constable painted this uh, some 15 years later, and this is his, his painting, which can be seen in Tate Britain. Uh, unusual for Constable that it actually does depict the, the smoke and filth of London. You can see St Paul's Cathedral in the background. Constable really resisted painting uh, some of these sort of things within his paintings, but uh, this is a rarity among Constable's paintings that you have this in the back. But we do all have the royal barges in the forehand. And um, Claude Money, of course, painted Waterloo Bridge in one of those peace super fogs and uh, a sort of glints of the sun upon, the, upon Waterloo Bridge, a sort of early Waterloo sunset in a way, one might say, 1906. And here we have um, probably the greatest painting of, of the Thames, and this is the fighting Temeraire being tugged to her last both birth to be broken up by uh, J.M.W. Turner. I often talk about this painting, but this painting is, is one of the, the great paintings. Uh, Turner consulted Michael Faraday about uh, some of the colours uh, that he was using at this time. And so, and so we can thank Faraday for some of the very, very bright crimsons and oranges that uh, Turner was using in his paint. But there he have almost the old ship from the uh, great Tra Battle of Trafalgar being tugged uh, along uh, from Rotherhithe uh, to, be, to be broken into pieces. And there we have the, the plucky steam tug dragging it forward to the boy, but it's a great painting and it has, uh, it says so much about the um, concepts of Turner's, Turner's art and probably one of his very greatest paintings. And then we come to Greenwich and Greenwich half tide as painted by uh, Atkinson Grimshaw again. And uh, here is another one of his favorite moonlights. And if you want to see a lot of uh, interesting uh, Victorian art of the uh, maritime art, and uh, 19th century maritime art, you could do worse than to go to the Maritime Museum in, in uh, Greenwich. Uh, they have some very fine examples there, including work by Turner and uh, well worth seeing. And there we have uh, also, uh, as we go along the river, uh, Wapping and Rotherhithe, um, this painting, again, this is the other part of um, the Tissot series, uh, his, his um, um, modern life, uh, Prodigal Son. Here he paints uh, the return of the Prodigal Son, 1882, and there is the son reconciled with his father. And a, a fine piece of painting we have here. Um, and, and this was probably painted at, uh, 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 beside the Thames at, at, at rather high, as did um, uh, Whistler. And his, when he came to London, he, he painted and etched at Wapping. And there's the Angel Pub, the pub at Rotherhide, frequented by Whistler. And uh, he painted a lot of some of the, the, these early paintings by Whistler are very well worth seeing if you really want to um, look at uh, the art of the River Thames. And there was a fantastic exhibition put together uh, by Tate Britain of um, uh, Whistler, Monet and Turner. And, uh, and it was a great looking at the three great artists of the Thames brought together. 
But uh, I hope this evening was, I've shown you some of the some of the artists that have really made the Thames what it is and brought out some of the um, some of the life of the Thames from the 19th century. And I thought we, I'd show you this unusual one by George Jones, uh, a lesser known painter from this era. But this is actually on the opening of the um, of the tunnel which goes under the Thames from Wapping to Rotherhithe. Uh, um, actually, the tunnel was um, engineered by uh, Isambard Kingdom Brunel's father, Mark Brunel. And here is uh, the opening of the a banquet in the Thames Tunnel. And uh, so this is under the River Thames, an interesting sort of painting. And there's a little illustration of the, uh, of the, the tunnel, which of course is worth uh, going to see. And there's an etching uh, above water, uh, whopping by Whistler. And now we're coming out to, to, the, to the estuary. And we come to Chatham Docks, and of course uh, Charles Dickens lived in in, in Chatham in the, in the early years. His father being a clerk in the uh, Navy Navy Pay Office at Chatham Docks, and uh, that's a little uh, contemporary um, uh, print of Chatham Docks, very very important, and also the rope making uh, uh, warehouses at Chatham, always worth seeing. And that uh, is Paul Maitland's painting, influenced by uh, Impressionism by the Newland School. And that's a, a late Victorian painting by Maitland of uh, the Sun Pier at Chatham. And, and there was a pier there for, there was a pleasure pier actually at Chatham. Um, still a busy, busy part of, uh, and going up of the river there. But um, uh, that gives you a little, little example of a, late, a later part of Victorian era painting of Chatham. And of course, so many came back to the river, to the estuary, and uh, Turner recalls the earlier era of the cutter fishing boats on the Thames estuary. Um, but many returned to London or returned, returned uh, to Chatham uh, to find uh, bad news on their arrival home. And uh, Arthur Hughes here depicts something, a very touching painting of the return of the young sailor boy uh, back, back, back home to discover that his mother has died in the intervening year. And this painting here is in the um, Ashmolean Museum in, in Oxford. And uh, we have at the moment a very uh, interesting, what looks like a very interesting exhibition opening uh, next week of pre-Raphaelite drawings. And there's actually a study for this particular drawing uh, um, painting uh, known as Home from Sea. And uh, it is by uh, Arthur Hughes, a great uh, devotee to the pre-Raphaelites. He wasn't a member of the Brotherhood, but a great friend of of, of many artists within the Brotherhood. The background is actually painted at Chingford Church Yard, but uh, depicts a, a very touching scene for many uh, Victorians and, uh, and a very successful piece of pre-Raphaelite painting. So there we are. I've just taken you on a trip down the Thames and uh, I hope uh, you've seen some paintings you like and uh, probably some you don't like, but um, I'd, I'd like to show you the good and the bad of these things. And uh, I shall just share my screen.